ಕ್ಯಾಂಪ್ ಟು ಅದ ಉತ್ಕಲ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಅಂಡ್ ದೋಸ್ ಆರ್ ಬಿಲಾಂಗ್ಸ್ ಟು ಉತ್ಕಲ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ದೆ ನೋ ಮೀ ಅಂಡ್ ಫಾರ್ ಔಟ್ ಸೈಡ್ ದೋಸ್ ಆರ್ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಸಿಪೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ಸೊ ಲೆಟ್ ಮಿ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಮೈ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಐ ಬಿಲಾಂಗ್ಸ್ ಟು ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಆರ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಮಿನರಲ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ನ್ಯಾಚುರಲ್ ಟೆಕ್ನಾಲಜಿ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಲ್ಯಾಬೊರೇಟರಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ ಯು ನೋ ದಟ್ ಮೈ ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕಲ್ಟಿ ವಾಸ್ ಗಿವನ್ ಎ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಉಮಾಕಾಂತ್ ಸೊಬಿದಿ ಹಿ ಇಸ್ ಮೈ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಸೊ ಹಿ ಮೈಟ್ ಹವ್ ಗಿವನ್ ಸಮ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಮೈ ಮೈ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಸೊ ಅವರ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಎ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಲ್ಯಾಬೊರೇಟರಿ ಆಫ್ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಆರ್ ಕೌನ್ಸಿಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೈಂಟಿಫಿಕ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಂಡಸ್ಟ್ರಿಯಲ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ uh we are working with so many areas and uh, this is a very beautiful lab uh, situated at the heart of the city bhubneswar and you can see here this is our institute building and we have a very green campus like utkal university like very good playground and a beautiful campus those who have time after this corona pandemic you can come to this institute i'll be happy to host so with this uh, introduction of my institute and this is uh, my group i am working as a principal scientist as well as an associate professor of academic csr and uh, this is my group activ- activity uh, in our chem- material chemistry department so our uh, objective of our my group activity is the development of bio and electrochemical active materials and we conceptualize those materials to develop some new and electrochemical processes electrochemical devices and they have tremendous applications like how you devise some Uh, <coughs> electrochemical processes for energy conversion energy storage energy conversion like water splitting to get hydrogen and oxygen from water energy storage like battery and super capacitor and electrochemical sensing of some biomolecules bioanalytes and also some environmental contaminants and their biomedical applications to define use this nanomaterial water we synthesize their biomedical applications for drug delivery and some development of electrochemical sensor and bio sensor that i am going to discuss here there three movie there is also in that script the nanotechnology term is used because so popular nanotechnology nowadays that so now their script is contains the nanotechnology terms so that from here you can understand how popular is nano science and nanotechnology so nowadays nanotechnology language is coming so you can see uh, previously a lot people know that bio bio or technology now they are putting the term nano nano biotechnology and people are using some nano dots nano bio dots nano wires nano electronics nano materials nano contracts so every are now they are putting a nano and with this word now new words is coming to, uh, to the dictionary new language is cre- has been created because of this nano science and nano technology is <coughs> applications and uh, is uh, popularized you can see the application of nanotech technology you can see any every sector from energy medicine nanobiotechnology nano device fabrications cosmetic industry nano fabrics everywhere there is a application of nano technology because nowadays people are uh, developing some materials and they are making this material in nano dimension so that this property is getting enhanced so this application is quite better so that's why it has a lot of application in every sector so in biomedical application especially you know there is a lot of material nano material that been synthesized that have been used for drug delivery applications development of bio sensors and also some nano material is used to develop some nano robots for brain surgery applications and also for cancer therapy you can see this iron oxide nano particle is used as a cancer ther- ther- therapy treatments so there is a lot of uh, biomedical applications even if you can see there is a lot of engineer nano materials have been developed they are trying to develop some nano porous materials carbon nano tubes and gold nano particle and different shape of nano particle so that that can be used as a carrier to take the drugs uh, to the living organism or they can release the drug on demand so when they trigger it they can release the drug so the targeted drug delivery can be done with this nano particles so like target specific delivery and in, in vivo labeling and imaging you can see the, the healthy cell and cancer cell or or any kind of disease affected cells you can be able to recognize by using this nano materials so there is a lot of application of the nano materials going on so that all you know just i'm giving some brief <coughs> idea about that if you can see the road to nano technology the nano science and nano technology so far how many things has been developed you know in 1959 this pine man 
all you know about that he has he has the dream that lot of uh, there is a plenty of room at the bottom he was thinking that if you can miniaturize you can get uh, some very small dimensional particle its property will be very interesting so that it will its property will many times better than his bulk counterpart even if he is uh, he dream about that but uh, the time will come uh, he was uh, given this uh, impression that uh, the time will come we can put a encyclopedia of information on the tip of a ball point pin pen so in small area you can keep lot of information but now his uh, dream has already fulfilled now you can see some terabyte kind of uh, memory device you can put in your pocket so even if you want library you can put in your pocket so his dream has already come into true so in 1974 uh, the Ta nario taniguchi he is a person from tokyo science university he is a scientist he has given the talk on nano technology because after the development of nano science and uh, the, the explore of science then this nano technology can be developed to development some devices for the benefit of society and the people in 1985 richard aswale he has developed this uh, Uh, Fullerene. Fullerene is a nanodimensional bulky ball, the shape of carbon nanoparticle. So you can see it has a lot of applications. So in 1991, the carbon nanotube has been explored. Sumio Ijima, he is the person from Japan. Uh, he has uh, explored the carbon nanotube. Though he has not got the Nobel Prize, but uh, he deserves that. And he was there here in Bhubaneswar. We had a conference during 2013. He came to Bhubaneswar, and he was showing one mobile in his pocket. You can see. I developed some carbon nanotube. Now the carbon nanotube is used as a display in my mobile. You can see this mobile is uh, having these carbon nanotubes. So this kind of a <clears throat> lot of uh, explores and uh, discovery has been done uh, through this development of nano science and nano technology. And interestingly, 2010, the new material graphene got the Nobel Prize. So graphene is comes from graphite. That is a new material, newly discovered material, which got the Nobel Prize. So this is a great. great Give to the nano science and nano technology. Well, you know what is graphene. You may know about it because it is very thin layers of graphite. Because if you can peel it out on a single layer of graphite, then it is called graphene. So it is all like one atom thick planar sheet and is put to bonded like benzene and it is all most stable to the nano material. And it is a planar kind of structure. You can see this molecular structure. It has a lot of application. This is a, it is a, just a gift in 2010, but the Nobel Prize now a lot of work is going on. This graphene oxides, graphene, reduced graphene oxides. So many applications uh, has already explored. All you know how graphene is prepared. You see, graphene is a mother of all carbon structure. You can see this is a graphene layer that we got from graphite. Again, you can restrike this graphene layer to get the graphite, and you can make it a ball so that you can form a fullerene. And also, you can wrap into a tube the carbon nanotubes. So, graphene is the mother uh, of all carbon-based materials. So, all you know about the story of graphene discovery because you can see <coughs> that uh, this you know, Keto Novoslo and uh, uh, this uh, Andrew Jam both are from Manchester, Manchester University. They are planning how it is quite impossible because when you can even put a single layer of carbon on the on a plane because all you know because of this high surface energy all the the tendency will be to make it spherical it will be too difficult to put a single layer of carbon frames on on any substrate so it was a uh, very tough difficult so but this person in very simple they just use a scotch tape a cello tape they put on the graphite uh, uh, on the graphite and take it out and put on the silicon substrate they did so many times And after they observed that a single layer of graphene is there on the silicon, so it is was possible. So that was really a breakthrough. So after the discovery of graphene, so there is a lot of applications of graphene. So graphene is a kind of two D material and a high surface area material. So it is for bio applications, lot of other applications like energy, the other coating, lot of applications are there. But you can see in bio medical application, graphene has explored in various directions like bio imaging, it is used. You can make make a graphene quantum ball. It can use for bioimaging purpose, tissue engineering, and gene therapy, drug delivery. You can load the drugs, and <clears throat> the graphene you can wrap over graphene. You can be by compatible nature. You can go auto therapy, antibiotic activity, biosensor development, tremendous application of bio <coughs> field. The graphene has been 
explored. So this is a kind of new material and this bit of nanotechnology, nanoscience to the society. So that's so that is the brief introduction about nanoscience and nanotechnology. All this nanoscience and nanotechnology deals with some <coughs> nanomaterials, nano dimension material. All you know that a nanomaterial is having a dimension one to hundred nanometer is called nano dimension. So how this nanomaterial has been synthesized? So there is a lot of roots, different kind of roots as already established to synthesize the nanoparticle. But the synthesis of nanoparticle like green method is really interesting because it has vital application. So it will not contaminate the process and it will not contaminate the environment. So the <clears throat> adopt of this green method is quite essential. So let's have some discussion about how we synthesize the nanoparticle. All you know about, briefly about that, so let me discuss briefly. All you know how we synthesize the nanoparticle is very easy. This is a top-down approach and bottom-up approach. We can break down the nanoparticle to break the bigger particle micro to get the nanoparticle. Or you can do a control reduction of uh, metal ions, so that the ions can be get converted to atoms and further nucleation of these atoms or control nucleation to go to the nanoparticle. That's called bottom up approach. This is quite old information, all you know about that. This is the top down approach uh, to break down, and uh, that uh, has some drawbacks and also some advantages. You can get more materials of this direction, but uh, the particle size distribution is uh, somehow difficult to maintain it by this top down approaches. And some expensive machines and a lot of energy is conjured by this kind of thing. In bottom of approach, what happened? So you can do some control reduction. You can use the metal and precursors. You can do some control reduction because here the nucleation and the growth of the nanoparticle will be easily controlled. So that's why bottom of approach is quite handy and easy. And it has a lot of advantages. And it involves so many approaches. Actually, the three methods that synthesize this. Uh, uh, nanoparticle by bottom up is one physical method, chemical method, and biological method. So, all you know, we are very much interested for biological methods for synthesis of nanoparticle. Before that, you know how physical methods of synthesis based on the application, where in which field we are applying. So, that's uh, that's uh, that in that direction we have to synthesize the nanoparticle. Suppose we are going to grow, so grow some nanoparticle on a substrate for some electronic applications. So in that direction, the, this biological route may not work. So in that case, we need some physical method, like vapor phase method, physical vapor deposition, laser ablation method. Uh, that way you can grow some single layers and uh, double layers of graphene, or you can put atomic arrangement of, <coughs> of things, uh, or layer a layer of nanoparticles or the substrates. Like mechanical method, like high energy, bar milling, Melt mixing, these are the methods used, and also some vapor phase methods like physical vapor deposition, chemical vapor deposition, or laser ablation, spotter deposition. These are the methods used for synthesis by physical methods. And chemical methods, it's very simple that you can take a metal precursor and some reducing reagent, stabilize the reagent, you add it and do the heating around 350 degrees or less than even room temperature, also the synthesis can be done. So it is very <coughs> easy to do in chemical processes, where a lot of reagents like chemical reagents, some structural uh, <coughs> directing reagents, and uh, some reducing agent we have to use. The biological method people use to tell this is a green synthesis method. Here, here you can use some organisms or some plant extracts. So these are bio-friendly in nature, nature, and that's why the nanoparticles are, will not be toxic in nature. So that's why this method is quite adopted for biological applications. So here you can use some microorganisms, fungus, bacteria, etc., to synthesize this nanoparticle. So all you know how these organisms is used, microorganisms is used for synthesis of this nanoparticle. So you can see bacteria can be used for uh, use the cell, and there's a lot of functional groups around the cell, and uh, it has some kind of molecules on its surface that can be used as a functional group to reduce the metal precursors. Fungus, algae, yeast, virus, all these are used for synthesis of nanoparticle. You can take this extract of these uh, uh, things like you can use this bacteria and uh, direct it to the your pot. To that you can add the metal uh, solution, then do some stirring and uh, keep it for overnight or long time so that then what will happen the nanoparticle easily reduced by this kind of microorganisms. So 
So that a lot of nanoparticles like metal, gold, platinum, palladium, as well as some metal oxide nanoparticles has been synthesized. Now the use of plant extract also. You can collect the plant extract from the leaf, board, and you can make it a powder. Then you can use this powder to extract some molecules from that the plant, and that extract you can do some filtration and uh, <coughs> purify that uh, plant extract and use this plant extract as a reducing reagent. So you can add this plant extract to the metal precursor. You can do by simple stirring and or you can do some elevated temperature by having like maybe around 60, 70 or 80 degree. But then at that time, what will happen? This plant extract has the capability because there's a lot of functional groups that, <coughs> that can reduce the metal precursors and they can provide the electrons for the reduction of metal ions so that the nanoparticles can be synthesized through the green methods. These are the green way of synthesis of nanoparticles. And what about the nanoparticles we synthesize? We have some of the nanoparticles. Most of the nanoparticles is spherical in shape because you know this nanoparticle is a highly energetic state when the atom will generate. They will do the nucleation so that they will make such a shape like spherical shapes to minimize the surface energy. So always there is a tendency to, to form the spherical nanoparticles. But the different shape of synthesis of nanoparticle is very much important because you know when different shape is, is coming up, then its uh, energy state will be very high and it is reactive, it is highly active. So a lot of uh, catalysis works, this uh, different shape of nanoparticle is used. And it has already developed and already explored that. If you can uh, control the shape of the nanoparticle, you can, uh, you can able to synthesize different shape of nanoparticle it will have a different property than the spherical shape nanoparticle. You can see that optical property of the nanoparticle changes when you can tune its uh, shape from spherical to some different kind of shapes like uh, prism, spherinkles, rod shape, tube shape, or like the other shape, then its the optical property will change. So you can see when the nanoparticle shape it changes, usually the spherical nanoparticle have some different color, but you can show it's a different color of nanoparticle you can get when you tune the shape. You can see the rod shape nanoparticle, gold nanoparticle, it will have some different color and see the optical property behavior will be different. If you can see the through UV visual spectra, you will get two absorption bands. One is longitudinal and transverse, <coughs> transverse band. But in the case of spherical, you will get only one band. So that's why it's the optical property changes and it's a different shape will be very easy to carry the drops and it will have more impact on drug delivery and surface enhanced rubber scattering applications. So it will be different shape and then it will, be, it will interact with the Raman <coughs> ray so that uh, this activity will be different so you can get very clear and highly intense signals. So this cells activity is used for sensing applications and high field emission may enhance the effect different shape is used and also different, different shape of the nanoparticle can give like different uh, properties and you can design and uh, by mimic of some smart devices like you can see you can construct a lotus leaf by constructing different shape of like hydrophobic surfaces and you can grow some nano wires and uh, flexible polymeric wires that can give you a very hydrophobic in nature so like uh, by different shape you can able to by mimic the smart surfaces and you can design that kind of structures and also you will have high selective catalyst compared to the spherical if you see the heterogeneous catalyst where the nanoparticle surface is used as a platform where the molecule will interact with the surface and the bond making and breaking will take place that time when different shape come into picture then that will help more uh, the it will enhance more catalytic activity compared to the spherical Set. This platform, the support of this uh, different shape will be better compared to spherical. So that's a lot of tendency and a lot of uh, <clears throat> effort has been carried out on how to growth, how to control the growth of nanoparticle during the synthesis so that you can go to one directional growth of nanoparticle making a rod shape nanoparticle or a different other shape of nanoparticle by tuning that. So we have observed that this green synthesis method is quite vital by this method you can able to get very different kind of shape of nanoparticle because this uh, plant extracts and these biomolecules, they have very beautiful structure and uh, capacity so that they can uh, interact with the atoms generated from the <coughs> precursors, metal precursors to give rise to a very nice shape. 
but if you can see some other phases like physical methods or some chemical method where actually strong reducing agent is used so it will be very difficult to control the nanoparticle shape so with that race in our laboratory we try to synthesize different shape of nanoparticle so i'm just going to highlight some of the nanomaterials what we synthesize in our lab so using some small biomolecules you can see here you know that uh, heps heps is used as a buffer solution heps buffer in biological application all you know from that background so this is a very simple molecule and it is a very good reducing agent and it can control reduce uh, control you can reduce the gold precursors like orochloric acid where u3 plus will be there so you can add to <coughs> to it heps like just 15 minutes stirring just you take the gold chloride solution add the heps with some Uh, concentration optimized control concentration in just stirring for 15 minutes you can see some whole nanoparticles form and you can see it's safe during the synthesis the after this uh, uvb zone spectra is different if you see the spherical it will give only one uh, peak but here it shows two different peak so that uh, it gives a signal that that different shape is coming you can see when you have done the transfusion in the microscope study you see very beautiful flower like shape is coming up so that time the, this was very interesting data we published this work in long year journal and all with some different application we study that i'm not going to discuss here with this similar way <coughs> we also use some different other biomolecules like <coughs> to synthesize green method green way of synthesis of gold nanoparticle here you can see you could able to some prism prism and perinkle set nanoparticle able to synthesize using high hydroxy tryptamine this is a bimolecular molecule and uh, this is a very interesting one similar also you can see this marigold shape gold nanoparticle we synthesize here very simple you take the precursor and use the five hydroxy indole three acetic acid this was a very interesting molecule hia that one uh, uh, very simple i think within 20 minute of stirring you take the precursor and add this reagent this is a bio biomolecule you put it and do the stirring for few time then uh, around 10 to uh, 20 minutes then you can see very nice uh, marigold shaped nanoparticle form so that what i am going to show this result is that so how this green methods green way of synthesis is helping to develop some different shape of nanoparticle and we have observed some other application not biomolecular application that's why i am not showing the application here and it has very interesting application when you compare to the spherical counterpart <clears throat> and here is this uh, in 2013 also we have published our work in chemistry european journal you know we took three different molecules like keratin this is a uh, bimolecule quercetin another bimolecule and catechol you can see this is all the uh, <clears throat> this uh, reducing functional group is your catechol so just you uh, change this structure for the structure to the catechol then different shape of nanoparticles form you can see this is some some kind of six <coughs> self uh, side of self nano particle is forming and this is some kind of fractal structure and spherical particles forming so this is about the beauty of green synthesis of nano particle also we have synthesized some silver nano particle you can see some uh, silver nano particles we synthesize like some dendrite and pair of power set nano particle we synthesize putting this rotin as a reducing agent this is as a simple biomolecule you just add to this precursor and stir for a few minutes and you can observe this uh, the that this nanoparticle form and this nanoparticle has some very good antibacterial property that we study so, and we compared with the spherical counterpart when you compare the spherical counterpart this shape different shape of spherical silver nanoparticle shows better antibacterial property because its interaction to the bacterial surface will be more so that it can kill more bacteria Surface that we have observed and this is one of publishing cases. So this is uh, why I am going to show that because how we can use some small biomolecules that can be useful for synthesis of very different shape of nanoparticle. You can see also palladium nanoparticle which is size. You can see this uh, palladium like chain like structure, uh, palladium some fractal structure. You can see dendritic structure and some porous structure you can able to synthesize using this gluten as a reducing agent. Here we can little bit increase the temperature up to 80 to 90 degree Celsius so that the it can easily reduce the palladium chloride and uh, you can see very beautiful different shape of nanoparticles form. So that's why these are the 
the discussion what I did and how we can utilize the small biomolecule for synthesis of some nanoparticles. And uh, <clears throat> after successful synthesis of nanoparticles, we have to explore its applications. We have synthesized different shape of nanoparticle and also different size of nanoparticle. And we try to apply that, how it can be used for uh, deployment of some kind of devices, some kind of applications. First, we study the electrochemical biases. We try to develop how you can utilize this nanoparticle. Here, we try to utilize the gold nanoparticle. And we use this gold nanoparticle as a kind of uh, uh, electron tunneling activity, how it helps uh, to tunnel the electrons uh, from the <coughs> reaction to the transducer surface that is reflected on increasing the current. So that I'm going to discuss about the electrochemical bias sensor, how we develop this nanoparticle. So, you know, if we're going to electrochemical bias sensor, why then why develops of electrochemical bias sensor? How, what is their, are their applications? Because electrochemical bias sensor used for bias sensing of biomolecules. So that is very much relevant to our health. So when our health is not good, then we have to go to the uh, <clears throat> cleaning for diagnosis. So that time you have to do some sensing systems to understand how much concentration of the relevant biomolecules. So that's why it is related to our health. All you know, this human being is the, uh, is the author of all our health. This is just a message. Everybody all knew that uh, we are responsible for our health, but you know, based on the society, how the way we are working, what kind of food, environment, all is uh, related to depends upon our health. But whatever it may be, we should be very much concerned about our health. Now in this pandemic situation, we are very much careful and that uh, protocol we should follow. But at the same time, when health is coming to a bad set, then we need some kind of diagnosis. And you know that 95% of uh, the disease is what we get because of this bad food habit, that uh, junk foods and different uh, kind of like, polluted food that uh, now uh, is a lot of pesticides and uh, different kind of things that they are adding to the, our uh, vegetables and grains. That's why a lot of disease is coming to uh, us and uh, our health is getting affected. So when we got the diseases, uh, then what we have to do? We have to go to the doctor, we have to go to the clinic so to do some kind of diagnosis, clinical diagnosis. How then how we will do the clinical diagnosis? We have to detect the clinically relevant molecules. For example, if I'm killing some uh, something uh, sleepy or some not feeling good, then uh, okay, they may think that we may be some sugar problem or something. Let us try to analyze how much sugar is there in our blood. So you have to do some lot of uh, some sensing of sugar molecules. So like some different kind of other uh, clinical element molecules, we have to do some uh, do the sense. We have to develop use some sensors to understand the uh, monitor the concentration of that uh, relevant molecules. Then that is, a, that is a fundamental understanding of their biological and physical function of relevant clinical molecules are there. If there is a change in the concentration of those uh, relevant molecules, that will lead to ages. So that's why you, this, those molecules are used as a, like a biomarkers to understand the uh, disease. The understand. So that's why you have to do the diagnosis of those relevant clinically relevant molecules. So you can see <laughs> this is a very interesting rewarding class so published. You can see so many molecules and by relevant uh, clinical molecules there in our body from very small molecules, very low concentration like uh, femtograms per liter to picograms per liter molecules are there. And some molecules like grams per liter is there in our body. Micrograms per liter molecules are there like uh, different concentration molecules are there, but they have some fixed concentration. If there is a change in the concentration of, of those relevant molecules, then that would lead to some weakness. So you have to monitor those concentrations. So like you can see some neurotransmitters are there in our <coughs> brain cells. If the concentration, some kind of deviation will be, there, will be there, that will give some kind of diseases. Like schizophrenia because of some kind of uh, changes in the neurotransmitters. Similar some protein analytes, nucleic acids, some other big molecule, biomolecules are there. They have some different concentration ranges there. So you have to develop some kind of sensor to monitor all these clinical relevant molecules. So what kind of sensor or biosensor we develop? So this is some just a component of biosensor. How you use a biosensor for sensing or biosensing those clinically relevant molecules. 
So here is some kind of schematical presentation showing. You can see these are these are the analytes of your interest. You want to monitor those analytes which is relevant to some kind of diseases. So you have to take some bioreceptor which is kind of some specific interaction with these analytes. That specific interaction can be reflected. There is a change in the pH or any change in the electroactive substances will be like that. This is a transducer. The transducer is just a, a carrier of the signal of the, the, their <coughs> specific interaction. If there is a specific interaction that leads some kind of changes, like maybe change of pH or, the, or uh, development of some different molecules, or that transducer will take this signal of the interaction of analyte and by receptor. And that signal you can see, we can able to measure this signal, even you can you device something, you can measure this signal and that signal you can give to the detector so that you can understand, okay, so how much analyte concentration is there. So this is the component of a biosensor. So there is so many different kind of biosensors so far is developed based on bioluminescent, electrochemical, optoelectron devices, type of piezoelectric thermoreactor based on different kind of properties of the material what you are using. So based on that, you can use this for sensing applications or biosensing applications. So out of that, this electrochemical biosensing I'm going to discuss, or it has some kind of advantage that I'm going to discuss. And this electrochemical biosensor are various types like amperometry where you can uh, <coughs> uh, able to provide the signal to current, you can measure the current changes and conductometry potentials, potentiometry, measuring some superficial charge when there is interaction between the analyte and the receptor. So that kind of uh, way you can able to device a biosensor. So that is the lot of application of biosensor as already told that not only the clinical way, some non-clinical applications are there, they are like environmental uh, things we can able to detect also. The clinical like in vivo, in vitro applications, you can use uh, this biosensor for uh, uh, sensing like artificial organs, uh, we said glucose monitoring, like blood glucose monitoring, some pathology, laboratory glucose monitoring, uric acid, ascorbic acid, some other relevant molecules you can use uh, clinically to detect, as well as non-clinical, like uh, some fruit ripe ripening, suppose you are storing some fruit and uh, transporting the fruits so that you get ripened, some different molecules will generate. That relevant molecules can, you can define some kind of bisensor so pollution monitoring, monitoring in our environment that can be used for development of biosensor to solve that purpose. And some environmental bio uh, <coughs> agent detections. And also some water, like in, you can see some water contaminants are there. Like some water contaminant or water bodies, some contaminants will be there, some molecules that you can develop some biosensor to detect that. So that's why the development of a biosensor has uh, Lot of applications, not from clinical point of view, also non clinical point of view, and the applications are. So you can see this is just an example of how the biosensor has been developed, the history of biosensors. So it was started in 1916 to try to develop some kind of biosensor to uh, some clinical molecules like protein, first report of, of immobilization of protein. So adsorption of invertase and activated charcoal, they uh, try to adjust that uh, invertase and get some signal. Uh, so that was some kind of work has been started in 1916. And slowly, a lot of development uh, was carried out. But in, uh, interestingly, in 1962, this first description of biosensor, glucose biosensor, has been developed by Clark, Professor Clark. So from there, it gave a lot of hope. A lot of biosensor has been developed so far. Now we see two different kind of biosensor has been developed just to <coughs> Uh, first change the property of the material and uh, this uh, analyte sub properties and the biosensor itself properties. But nowadays, now in the current point of view, so now people are using some nano materials, some different kind of materials whose properties are very interesting. And it's uh, the signal to noise ratio will be very high so that you can go for a very low limit of detection. We have some femtomolar, uh, some picomolar, femtomolar, that much concentration of analyte we can able to detect by using some kind of this innovative new nanomaterials, which is coming to the pictures. So <clears throat> the ideal biosensor, so far, what about the biosensor people have developed? The ideal biosensor, is, no biosensor so far is ideal biosensor. It's like no gas is like ideal gas. Similar like 
it's only a half of sufficient accuracy. Very exact, it will give you the exact concentration. And repeatability, suppose you can develop eye sensor, you can repeat for a long time, a similar result and very accurate results should give. And the speed of response, suppose you want to do the monitoring very quickly, suppose you go to the clinic and do a, give the sample, within a few minutes they can give you the result. That kind of speed response or sufficiently can, can develop some bias sensor so that you can give the quick data. And there's some sufficient dynamic rate. And suppose you can see some biological system, some molecules are very low concentration, some molecules are high concentration. Is it possible you can devise some bias sensor so that it can able to detect in low concentration? As well as it can detect high concentration. That it can work in at a different dynamic range. Also, it should be insensitive to environmental interference. Suppose in your biological system, a lot of other molecules are there. Some molecules may get inter, do the interference. Maybe they come into that uh, range so that their concentration can interfere to the concentration of the relevant molecules. So that if that you can design some biosensor which will be insensitive to some other uh, uh, molecules present, but it's very much sensitive, very much specific to the <coughs> molecules of our interest, then it will be kind of ideal biases. So in that point of view, so many electrochemical biases have been developed and we have observed that electrochemical biases are, they have high sensitivity and also they are very high selective because when you, <coughs> they have some specific voltage to do the oxidation reduction. So, and also you can go for low detection limit because now these electrochemical devices and instruments have been developed in such a way that you can be able to detect very nano uh, ampere to uh, pico ampere currents. So that is very much relevant to monitor the concentration of pico amperes. So low detection limit you can go and rapid monitoring. You can make some channels like a 24, 25, 20, uh, like 100 channels of electrode you can develop. You can <coughs> rapidly monitor many clinical relevant molecules. In that point of view, this electrochemical biosensor has given a lot of uh, hope and a lot of development has been carried out and a lot of applications still are going on. The electrochemical biosensor, how it is developed, it is very simple. You can see this electrochemical biosensor uh, use some uh, biological recognized element like enzymes, protein, antibodies. These are some uh, kind of receptors that selectively react with targeted analyte. So any analyte you want to monitor, so that can selectively react, uh, this receptor can selectively react with this analyte and produce an electrical signal. When they selectively inter interact to the analyte, then what will happen? They will give some signals, like electrical signals. So you can capture this electrical signal and this electrical signal can capture by a transducer and that transducer can provide the signal to the detector and that can be reflected as an increase in the current. You can see, you put the analyte and this receptor can take this analyte and interact with the analyte and provide the electrons, uh, some kind of electrical signal to the transducer and that can be reflected to the increase in the current or it, it, that is changing the voltage or that is changing the charge. And you can see this uh, current response is directly proportional to the concentration of the analyte. So you can see how much concentration of analyte is there, so that can be monitor how much current we got, how much current changes is, has happened. So this is the way the electrochemical biosensor works. I have already told that electrochemical biosensor different types, like when you design like amperometric uh, electrochemical biosensor where you can use the applied current or you can measure the current due to the redox reaction between the analyte and the Acceptor or a potential, uh, so potentiometric bias sensor where there is a change in the charge or there is a change in the voltage, like uh, ion selecting electrodes, such as pH meter, similar kind of uh, bias sensor has already developed where the analyte is interacted, so that can lead to some change in the voltage or change in the <laughs> charge. And also, conductivity for impedance was how in the electrolyte you can put the analyte as well as the uh, your receptor, then that will change the conductor, conductance of this medium that can you can measure through impedance. So that can help to develop electrochemical biosensor. So far, a different kind of electrochemical biosensor has been divided. Like you can see, there's two types of electrochemical biosensor. One is biocatalytic sensor, and another is affinity sensor. Based on the how you can choose the receptor. So what kind of receptor you are choosing? 
So based on that, they have changed. I based on the nature of the biological recognized processes. That's called receptor. Suppose you can use some receptor like enzymes where the enzymatic catalytic process takes place. Suppose your analyte will go to the enzyme, that enzyme will interact with the analyte and that can give some another product. So that kind of catalytic means they can enzymatically convert from one product to another. Another is affinate based sensor means that suppose you design the some transducer, you, you immobilize this receptor, then another, your analyte will go, will interact with the receptor and just there will be a physical interaction or any chemical interaction. That interaction will give some kind of changes in the electrical signal. So just a binding interaction, nothing catalytic, no reduction or oxidation takes place. But in bicatalytic, some oxidation reduction will take place. So in that way, the two different, based on the analyte, who, what kind of analyte, whether that analyte will get, get oxidized or reduced, or that analyte cannot be get oxidized or reduced, then at that time you can use the affinity based sensor. So, hello, uh, may I uh, know from any participant, I'm audible to all of you properly. My voice is uh, reaching to all of you. Hello, anybody here to me? The vehicles people have developed, so any kind of product you see, there is a lot of development based on the preparation. You can see the initial preparation, Sorry, I just want to take some water. So some initial development will <coughs> give a scope for further development. We'll have some kind of drawbacks and disadvantages. Then to overcome that, some new technology, new UAF will work with tech space. So that's why in every sector, in every way, there is a lot of development through first generation, second generation, third generation. Similarly, in electrochemical biosensor, they have also different stages. First generation biosensor has been developed. So that generation generated biosensor, like some catalytic based biosensor, for example, is oxygen based biosensor. Here, whatever they have taken the electrode, but inside the electrolyte, inside the solution, what they and they dip the electrode, but inside the solution, they put the enzymes. So then what happens when they put the substrate, then the enzyme uh, is getting enzymatically convert to product in the presence of oxygen. That's called oxidase based biosensor. But here what happened with this, this case of case, so oxygen is a cofactor. So without oxygen, this enzyme will not work. So that they pass the oxygen into the solution, they put the enzyme, suppose they want to convert alcohol to alcohol uh, aldehyde or something. So they put some alcohol dehydrogen in the enzyme. So then what will happen, this alcohol will convert it to some product like aldehyde, then oxygen will generate hydrogen peroxide. So then this hydrogen peroxide is uh, getting oxidized uh, by this electrode and gives the electron to the uh, transducer and that can be reflected as the increase in the current. So this is the first generation they developed, but here the problem was they use the enzyme inside the solution. So what happened the, inside the solution, the enzyme takes place, then it generates hydrogen peroxide and the electrode is far away from this solution. And slowly what will happen, the hydrogen peroxide generated will be diffused to the electrode surface. So that's why what happened, there is a delay in the uh, signals, so delay in the passage of the signals. So that's why this first generation was not that much sensitive or we cannot give for a lot of lower limit of detection because whatever the hydrogen peroxide is generated, all are not going to the electrode surface. Some is, is getting dissolved inside the electrolyte. So that's why this first generation was not that much sensitive. Then to increase that, they try to avoid that, they have to increase the performance. They have some tools, use some redox mediator. That means when uh, this oxygen is used, then hydrogen peroxide should be generated. So then hydrogen peroxide is getting again oxidized. So in that case here, what happened, they use some redox mediator and this redox, redox mediator has very fast oxidation reduction takes place. So in this case, when the enzyme is interacted with the substrate, then they provide the electron to the redox mediator and this redox mediator quickly oxidizes and gives the electron to the redox, to the surface of the electron. So in that way, they can be able to detect the analyze. But in this case, some drawbacks were there. What was there? This redox mediator is getting disintegrated, and uh, some of the redox mediator may not be uh, soluble in the um, uh, biological sol uh, solvents or 
like uh, medium biological medium so also, there was some kind of disadvantage was there so to uh, avoid that uh, they tried to use some kind of other method like third generation what they did they try to develop some kind of technique where they put enzymes directly on the electrode surface no need to put on the solution so here the lot of enzyme is used because you, when you are using the solution there should be more quantity of enzyme you have to use but when you use the enzyme on the electrode surface here you can use very less quantity and it will interact with the electrode surface and what electrolyte is generated by this enzyme by due to the interaction of the substrate it can directly give the electron to the electrode surface so that way the lot of development was go, was going on so that was the third generation now this nanoparticle based uh, biosensor kind of fourth generation biosensor i can give the example later so before that let me discuss about this electrochemical biosensor is kind of uh, divided with <clears throat> can be classified with two types generally like oxidase based biosensor so you can choose the oxidase enzymes and in that case when here oxygen is used as a cofactor you know, you will generate hydrogen peroxide suppose if you are using this analyte you want to detect then this analyte is proportional to the concentration of hydrogen peroxide generated so if you can monitor the concentration of hydrogen peroxide that is directly proportional to the concentration of substrate so in that case oxidase biosensor is one so in case of dehydrogenase based biosensor the principle is same but here the cofactor is not oxygen here is the nad plus so if you use the nad plus what will happen this nad plus this uh, dehydrogen enzyme will convert convert this nad plus to nadh and uh, in the presence of the analyte you want to monitor and that will generate an nadh if you can detect nadh how much is generated that is directly proportional to the concentration of this analyte of your interest so that's why in electrochemical biosensor so how we can design some kind of uh, uh, method <coughs> so that you can easily detect hydrogen peroxide or nadh so that it will be very sensitive electrochemical biosensor for <coughs> for this kind of oxidative based biosensor and dehydrogenase based biosensor that i am going to discuss okay somebody is doing something uh, on the screen so it is coming some different color so that should be avoided so let us come to the topic here you see this is the uh, structure of nadh you can see the nadh molecule looks like this this is a kind of generated when nad plus is used for dehydrogen enzyme here is a <coughs> two electron one proton reduction method okay so this is a very interesting molecule so if you can develop some kind of sensor which can is very much good for detection of this nadh then that can be used as a electrode for by sensing of any kind of dehydrogen genase based <coughs> processes to so for that purpose what we did <coughs> we try to use some nanoparticle modified electrodes because we try to use utilize this nanoparticle whether when you put the nanoparticle to the electrode surface whether it is playing a good tunneling electron tunneling purpose or not whether it is allowed for the good electrical signal purpose so that we try to explore to uh, to do that we have to wear or you have to do the self assembly metal nanoparticle on the electrode surface so we have developed this method like three market profile try with excellent this molecule we do some hydrolysis and condensation process to make a three dimensional network then you do the self assembly on the gold electrode surface then you self assemble the nanoparticle by dipping this things on the gold nanoparticle because a lot of thiol groups that's why it is getting attached to the gold nanoparticle so this gold nanoparticle modified sensor has been uh, developed so <clears throat> so i request one of the participant uh, they might have uh, done something to the screen so they, that they may remove it so you can see when you modified with the nanoparticle on the electrode surface we try to check whether it is response is good for nadh or not you can see without the nanoparticle modified electrode you see the nadh oxidation it is taking plus at a high over potential high potential you can see it is coming at 0.8 to 0.9 it is getting oxidized but when you put the nanoparticle you see at low potential it is getting oxidized at around 0 volt close to 0 volt very low potential it is getting oxidized and you can see the 950 millivolt like just like one 
world, it is getting reduced to the upper potential. And the response is very stable when you put the nanoparticle. And uh, <coughs> that's why what we thought that, okay, as this nanoparticle modified electrode shows good sensitivity to NADX, let us use this nanoparticle modified electrode to integrate this hydrogen enzyme to the electrode surface. So before that, what we did, uh, so here what we did, we tried to do the amperometric sensing of, of this gold nanoparticle modified electrode because this amperometric sensing is quite sensitive technical. We could be able to nanomolar, nano current range you can be able to detect. So when you use this uh, nanoparticle modified electrode for amperometric sensing of NADH, we can see very low detection limit, like high nanomolar concentration of NADH can be detected. With such low concentration of NADH, if in enzyme activity, this much low concentration of energy is generated, then this sensor can capture. So that's why you thought that, okay, this nanoparticle modified electrode is very good for NADH sensing system. Then let us put some enzyme to the its surface. So here, what we did, we, we, we uh, try to wear this dehydrogen enzyme and nanoparticle uh, with this uh, silicate network on the electrode surface so that both the enzyme and nanoparticle is there on the electrode surface. But I have shown to you like third generation biosensor where they have used the enzymes on the electrode surface. But here we put some tiny nanoparticle on the electrode surface. We claim this is a kind of fourth generation biosensor. And, and you have tested this for using like a, uh, alcohol dehydrogenase, uh, lactate dehydrogenase for sensing of ethanol and lactate. So it was successfully used for detection of lactate and ethanol by using this dehydrogen enzymes. You can see the allodic lactate like 0.1 micromole, ethanol 20 micromole. And we have made some kind of patent of this work. And uh, this can be used for, you can see like uh, the <coughs> traffic police and they can use for the uh, drink and drive cases. Those are usually taking some alcohols. This al ethanol based devices can be used to detect that. We have already made some patent and some companies is oxidative based, based, based enzymes for sensing of that molecules. So like glucose, we have to look glucose oxidase. So in that case, we try to develop an oxidative based electrochemical biosensor, where the uh, principle is like this, you use the oxygen as a cofactor, you use the enzymes on the electrode surface. So when the uh, enzymatical activity of this analyte uh, with, with this oxidase based enzymes, it will generate hydrogen peroxide. If you can design some electrode which can easily and very sensitive way it can detect hydrogen peroxide that can be used for sensing of this kind of oxidative based biosensors. So what we did, we have tried to develop some kind of platinum nanoparticle modified electrode because we have observed that this platinum nanoparticle modified electrode is sensitive towards hydrogen peroxide and that can detect hydrogen peroxide very easily. So we checked with this uh, platinum nanoparticle modified electrode uh, by similar way, the way we have developed some gold nanoparticle on the electrode surface, here you use the platinum nanoparticle modified electrode. You can see how this nanoparticle is modified on the electrode surface. And this is the same image as uh, gives justifies and uh, proves that the nanoparticle is there on the electrode surface. So we use this nanoparticle for uh, uh, sensing of hydrogen peroxide because for oxidase based enzyme, Hydrogen peroxide detection is very much essential. We try to do some electrochemical cyclic voltage to understand at what potential hydrogen peroxide is getting oxidized. We observe that it's 0.5 or 45 millivolt, uh, per 50 millivolt, like 0.5 volt. And also using this uh, uh, technique, we develop some amperometric technique by holding the electrode or at that potential. When you inject hydrogen peroxide, that can be reflected increasing the current. So you put the uh, hydrogen peroxide into the solution, your electrode or nanoparticle modified electrode will be there. So when you put the hydrogen peroxide, it is quickly oxidized and give the change in the current. You can see this uh, increase the current is direct proportional to the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. With this uh, amperometric sensing technique and this platinum modified electrode, we could be able to detect sub nanomolar concentration of hydrogen peroxide, which is very below nanomolar concentration. So that it will be very good for sensing very low concentration of uh, oxidized based enzyme sensors. So with that, what we did, we tried to integrate the, the biosensor the way we have done for hydrogen 
uh, hydrogenase enzyme isensor. Here, what we did, did we did the we tried to wear this nanoparticle platinum and uh, this uh, oxidase enzymes on the local surface. Both are there uh, attached to the uh, our uh, transducer. So then, what happened when we add uh, any analyte? Like suppose we have done some uric acid uh, <coughs> uric acid enzyme we have used uric acid sensing system. So when you add some uric acid, what happened? In the uric acid enzyme which convert uric acid to allantoin to product in the presence of oxygen to get hydrogen peroxide and that generated hydrogen peroxide is getting easily oxidized by our nanoparticle modified electrode and give the current signal that you can see how when you put the uric acid then it how it hydrogen peroxide is generated and that is reflected in the current and this change in the current is direct proportional to the concentration of uric acid so in that way you have developed and uh, some sensors of oxidase based enzymes. And further, what we did well, after the development of graphene, as I have told that tremendous application of the graphene because it is a very interesting platform because a lot of nanoparticles enzymes can be easily loaded on the electrode surface. For this fourth generation biosensor, where the wearing of nanoparticle or assembling of nanoparticle enzyme on the electrode surface is required, in that case. This one, uh, graphene will play a vital role because it has high surface area, area material and electrical conductive. So that's why when you put enzymes on nanoparticle, then when the electron transport process takes place, so that it can easily give the electron to the electron surface. So for that purpose, what we did, we tried to develop some oxidase enzymes like xanthine oxidase we used, and that xanthine oxygen implying that oxygen xanthine oxidase we able to detect some xanthine molecules. And the, how much important of xanthine all you know that I'm going to discuss. And there were a lot of biomedical applications. So here we have to, we did, we tried to wear the platinum nano particle. But here the platinum we have developed, not spherically, some branch shape, because already I have discussed how different shape of nanoparticles has quite a better performance than the spherical counterpart. So here what we did after development, after, after uh, synthesis of this platinum nanoparticle, branch platinum nanoparticle, and you put on the graphene surface and you try to check how it is helping for hydrogen peroxide sensing. You can see when you put the platinum, branch platinum nanoparticle with the graphene, you can see the oxidation potential is lower than the previous one. The previous one is 0.45, you see 0.37. You see, the, it is decreasing the overall potential. And also, uh, it is uh, amperometry, we have done with different and then to understand how this hydrogen peroxide is getting diffused the electrode surface, that is some kind of electrode phenomena to understand that I'm not going to discuss more. And here you can see through CV, when you increase the hydrogen peroxide concentration, you can see there is an increase in the current which is observed. Uh, that uh, from there you can understand how it is helping to detect hydrogen peroxide. And uh, then we have done the amperometry sensing that I already discussed. When you put the <coughs> hydrogen peroxide on the graphene and branch platinum nanoparticle modified electrode, then what happened? Hydrogen peroxide is getting oxidized and quickly uh, gives the uh, electrical signals. And that electrical signals can be measured through the increase in the current. We can see this one. So uh, as uh, this uh, nanoparticle modified, uh, branch platinum nanoparticle modified graphene electrode is so very good towards hydrogen peroxide, we thought that we can use this for development of some oxidase based biosensor. So before that, we try to measure whether this nanoparticle modified graphene, uh, platinum, uh, branch platinum and graphene modified electrode is stable or not. If it is not stable, whether we develop biosensor, it may work for one day, but that will not uh, solve our proper purpose. So we check the stability of this electrode towards hydrogen peroxide. We try to monitor one is called storage stability, another is operational stability. Storage means today we have done some measurement. After one day, uh, again we did the measurement. Like that, we observe that it is uh, somehow uh, working up to 14 days. And uh, same electrode every day you can use. That means you can use a disposable kind of electrode. 14 times you can use. And operational, we have done uh, <coughs> the operation continuous for more than kind of one hour. It is working. So that's why it's uh, uh, stability of this electrode. Uh, storage and operational stability is quite better than what uh, uh, we did. We try to understand the interference test. 
that I have already discussed for electrochemical or any kind of ideal vaccines are when you want to monitor some molecule. Other molecules are there in our body. Biological samples are there. They may uh, interfere or not. So in that case, what we did we, for hydrogen peroxide detection, we added some ascorbicid, uric acid, glucose, dopamine. We observed that whether they may play some role or not, but they are not playing any role. Because when we put the hydrogen peroxide, there is an increase in the current, but other molecule does not respond by this kind of sensor, like graphene and branch plasma modified electrode. So as this nanoparticle modified electrode shows better response towards hydrogen peroxide than what we thought, let us utilize to develop some uh, dehydrogen uh, oxidized based biosensor. So what do we did, we, we assembled the xanthine oxidase, an, another enzyme which is convert the uric acid, <coughs> sorry, which convert the xanthine to uric acid. So that convert the xanthine to uric acid at the same time, uh, the oxygen present inside the solution which convert to hydrogen peroxide. The hydrogen peroxide, what is uh, generated that can easily oxidize uh, by this uh, platinum nanoparticle on the graphene surface and provide the electrical signal to the electrode. So this system was used for the detection of xanthine. Because why there is important of xanthine detection from biological point of view, because all you, it has a lot of clinical relevant molecule and it is really associated with some kind of significant diseases. If there is a change in the concentration of xanthine, that will lead to, leads to xanthinuria and some kind of syndrome, uh, lesnian syndrome kind of diseases developed. So that's why from clinical point of clinical diagnosis purpose, we develop, should have some kind of biosensor to monitor the concentration of xanthine. And another interesting case is called the packaging of uh, this uh, fish. So if you put uh, the fish and store the fish and you can transport the fish from one place to another, if the fish get rotten, then what will happen? There are a lot of xanthine will generate. So to understand, they have to insert the biosensor whether the fish is get fresh or it's get rotten. So that's why that kind of purpose also, this kind of biosensor has applications. So, so that's a lot of uh, um, imaging is there, that's why we could be able to develop this kind of biosensor. And this uh, uh, platinum nanoparticle and uh, graphene based uh, biosensor has uh, given us very much uh, sensitivity to detect xanthine. And this work we published in Dr. Kimika Alta. So with this, uh, then we have tried to develop some electrochemical apparatus sensing of xanthine. And you can see when you added the xanthine, that is uh, generated hydrogen peroxide, that generated hydrogen peroxide can be reflected at the increase in the current. And this increase in the current is directly proportional how much xanthine is uh, generated. So uh, how much xanthine is utilized? So that's why the xanthine concentration is could be able to monitor by this principle. So that was the story about how you can use this nanoparticle modified electrode for sensing, uh, for biosensing applications how we can wear the oxygen based enzymes, where we can wear the dehydrogenase based enzymes on the electrode surface, and uh, we could be able to some development of some electrochemical biosensor. So, another interesting topic I'm going to discuss that is called electrochemical sensor. What is electrochemical biosensor? Sensor? Biosensor, where we can use a biorecognized elements like uh, any kind of receptor when you immobilize on the electrode surface. When we will not use any receptor, direct the nanoparticle on the electrode surface, whether that can be used for sensing purpose or not. Now, some of the molecules, clinical molecules are there, or any molecules which is associated to some kind of diseases that can be directly detected using this nanoparticle modified electrode. There are some uh, molecules are there that may not work through enzymatic activity. So how we can be able to sense that molecules? So in that purpose, we develop some electrochemical sensor we try to use this nanoparticle on the electrode surface, then we try to develop some sensors. So now I'm going to discuss about this. So one thing I'm going to discuss about how we utilize nanoparticle and develop some electrochemical sensor for detection of arsenic. You know why arsenic is very much inter interesting. Uh, you know, arsenic and mercury, these are highly toxic in nature, and these are associated with many health problems. You know, arsenic, which is associated with like a bladder cancer, lung cancer, skin lessons. If you see uh, some kind of uh, arsenic affected area peoples, you can see their hand and their uh, foot uh, 
palm will look like this because a lot of uh, some wounds, uh, that's called skin lesions is developed. And this is poisonous because arsenic concentration, like more than two ppb in your drinking water, that will lead to very dangerous disease like cancer. So uh, the World Health Organization has provided a guideline value of 10 ppb. Uh, if it is permissible, it will be 10 ppb. But after that, the environmental protection agency, they have observed that, okay, 10 ppb is huge. If you, if you the drinking water have two ppb, then uh, that is safe to drink. If below uh, 2 pp, it is safe to drink. If more than that, uh, that is some kind of uh, uh, danger signal. So that's why we have to understand how much arsenic is there in the water because it leads to some kind of health uh, problems. And another interesting thing is that and uh, some geographical regions in the world, in India, is such that some of the area is like that. So in their uh, <coughs> ground level, arsenic containing ore surface. You cannot avoid that. Like some iron ores are, are there in some area. Similarly, arsenic containing ores are there. So if you can use that drinking water from the groundwater level, use that water for drinking purpose, the, they are getting contaminated with arsenic. It's very, you cannot do that because that groundwater is level is uh, by this get up by the nature's point of view, view that area is contaminated with the arsenic. So that's why you have to develop some kind of sensor to monitor the concentration of arsenic if you are drinking. If the concentration is high, we have to use some kind of filtration systems or some removal systems to reduce that concentration, then it will be safe to drink. So for that purpose, we need to a sensor. So here we try to use this nanoparticle modified uh, electrodes that uh, what we used in the previous study. So here we use the gold nanoparticle modified electrode of the electrode surface. We try to use this for sensing of arsenic. When you use this nanoparticle modified electrode, we could be able to do by electrochemically uh, detect this arsenic. And uh, these are the some kind of square of technique. That kind of technique is used in electrochemistry to detect. And you can be able to detect like 0 0.02 pp. Can you imagine? It is a soft ppb level because the World Health Organization and Environmental Protection Agency, they have provided a guideline value of 2 ppb. But uh, our sensor, you can see soft ppb level it can detect. That means if some kind of arsenic contamination is there in your water, then this sensor can able to detect that. So it is quite interesting. And further, we try to study the interference like mercury, another toxic element of whether mercury is getting interfered or not. No, mercury is not interfering. Mercury is getting oxidized in different potential, copper and some other lead. And so we have checked there oxidizing other potential. Only specifically the arsenic getting oxidized in this potential. So that's why it is highly sens sensitive and specific to the arsenic. Then after development of this sensor, we tested in our laboratory, then what we thought that, okay, so we have to check the particle application. So we have to collect some water where there is a, the uh, area is affected with the arsenic. So you can see uh, there is a lot of uh, areas like geographical origins. I am already informed that their groundwater is already contaminated with the arsenic. When they use this groundwater uh, for a drinking purpose, then uh, that is also contaminated with that. And I'm very uh, surprising that in our India, Bangladesh, and neighbor, neighbor country, and uh, India, India also, uh, uh, in some of the district of uh, uh, West Bengal is getting affected with arsenic. You can see uh, some 3,417 villages of West Bengal is uh, having. Uh, Arsenic more than 50 ppb. You can see Barakpur block is there, 24th Paragnas district. The, the, those areas are also affected by arsenic. I have visited to that area and you can see there are also a lot of NGOs are working and the government is working. It is a lot of filtration units. How you can separate the arsenic so that it can, they can use the safe drinking water. But problem is the uh, we need a very robust sensor. Suppose you use a filter system. After filtration, how much concentration is there? Before filtration, how much concentration is there? You have to monitor. Other than that, it will give a killing effect to the health. So that's why in this area, it's very much essential to use this kind of sensors. So that's why we have collected the groundwater from that area. Then we have done some analysis. And we have, using this our sensor, we can able to see. You can see, uh, you can calibrate that one sample from this 24th paragraph, it is coming at around 
51.4 ppm where this is a report already mentioned that is around 50 ppm that means our sensor is perfectly matching so we have uh, done some patent of this work and uh, one company has already taken this one already developed some sensors and it's already there in the market it is used for the society and another interesting example i'm going to give you how we have developed some electrochemical sensor for sensing of dopamine you know dopamine dopamine is a kind of neurotransmitter all you know so dopamine is uh, how it uh, controls our uh, what activity like uh, uh, our feeling activities so it is a neurotransmitter it is present in our brain cells dopamine functions like feeling pleasure and bliss if you are happy and the dopamine concentration uh, release that also controls and also dopamine deficiency if the dopamine concentration release will be low then you will feel sad so that's why this uh, kind of molecules is very much essential in clinical molecules when people are under depressions or some kind of uh, <coughs> uh, split disorders or uh, um, bipolar disorders then there is some kind of uh, different release of dopamine so you have to understand how much dopamine is there is released into, uh, in the brain cells so based on that we have to give uh, the drugs to control that so that's why the concentration dopamine detection is very much essential so here what we did we tried to utilize this nanoparticle modified electrode for sensing of dopamine so here we develop some micro electrodes like uh, the electrode dimension is less than 5 nano micrometer so you can see some fiber electrodes carbon fiber electrode we uh, developed where we each the carbon fiber we put the nano gold rings into it then you do the self assembly these are the very interesting technique this work when i was in uh, usa during my post at the university of washington seattle we developed this kind of systems so you can see we could able to immobilize nano particle on this carbon fiber modified electrodes uh, uh, then uh, you can see we have done the same to understand how the nano particle is there then in this carbon already done and we have reported this text also as a publication so that was a very interesting things we discussed about how you can use this nano particle for electrochemical sensing purpose electrochemical bio sensing purpose so another thing very few slides i have uh, so thank you for all your patience to discuss how we can develop some optical sensor optical sensor means what you know there is a lot of biomolecules chemical relevant molecules are there that may not get oxidized or reduced by this electrochemical processes then how will sense that one we cannot get oxidation currents or reduction current no current signal we get so that's why we thought how we can use some other way so that we can use this nano particle as a sensing platform for sense those molecules so here we what you see the nano particle has <coughs> very interesting optical property you can see This is the gold nanoparticle. It has uh, when the light is interacted with the gold nanoparticle, you can this surface charge is getting polarized. That is is reflected as a absorbance. It gives you individual absorbance at this. Like you can gold nanoparticle will come around 500 to more like 5, 15, 520, around 10 to 15 nanometer gold nanoparticle can show like 500, 15 nanometer or that is showed in the absorbance. we will tune the size of the nanoparticle shape you can see you can synthesize a gold nano rod you can see it can give some different absorbance band it will give transverse as well as longitudinal band so this has some optical properties different when a light is interacted with the nanoparticle the nanoparticle surface charge it gets polarized so that's why it is giving some absorbance field here but in simple metals they don't have absorbance field so we utilize this absorbance properties this optical properties and we uh, explore that chameleon chameleon property chameleon you know indu the chameleon property means when based on the situation they can change the color the chameleons so uh, whether it is green leaf they will green when they are in the bird they are red color similar if you can tune the color of this nanoparticle through their absorbance changes then that can help us to detect some kind of interesting molecule you see you see this nanoparticle gold nanoparticle we developed You see, if there is an intra, this absorbance depends upon not only shape, size, but also interparticle distance. If the interparticle distance is somehow, somehow, uh, some distance, 
the color will be different. If you can close it, make it little aggregation, uh, then what will happen? Upon the color will be different. You can see this red wine color, it will be like purple color. So you can see this is one example. We have synthesized the nanoparticle, citrate stabilized nanoparticle. When you do some control aggregation, the color is changing and this observance property is changing. So this behavior of this nanoparticle, we try to utilize to detect some kind of interesting biomolecules. Uh, the clinical relevant molecules like polyalanine drugs, heparin and proton, all those who are in working in the health medical <coughs> and uh, biomedical field who are working, they know about what is heparin and proton. Heparin is kind of anticoagulant, uh, which is used for surgical procedures. You know, when there is a uh, bypass surgery, any kind of surgery takes place, what will happen? This heparin is used as an anticoagulant because the antithrobin, which is uh, uh, <coughs> Made some blood clot that can clot the blood passage when there is a wound in your skin. The all of a sudden, antithrombin will release and they will clot the blood so that the blood flow will, flow will not be there. But during the surgery, the blood flow should be there so, the, so that the artery, nerves, how they will make it uh, connect. So when there will be clot, then they cannot connect. So that's why they will add some heparin. What will happen? Heparin will bind to the antithrombin so that it will not allow the blood clot. So when the surgery is complete, then they will try to take it out of the heparin. They will add something like protamin. So protamin will specifically bind to heparin and heparin will release the antithrombin. That means there is a very good relation, interaction between heparin and antithrombin. You add heparin, heparin will bind to the antithrombin. And if you put protamin, protamin has a very strong interaction with heparin. In that time, what will happen? It will release the antithrombin. So then blood clot will take place after the surgery. So for this polyiron drug, how much concentration of heparin is there in the blood, based on that you have to add the protein, other than it will be get pro. So that's why this polyiron drug's concentration monitoring is very much essential. We need a sensor to understand it. So here what we did, we tried to develop some kind of uh, optical sensing system. What, are, what we did, you see this gold nanoparticle is synthesized, the negatively charged citrus stabilized gold nanoparticle. So when you add protamin, this protamin is a highly positively charged molecule. So then when you add protamin, what will happen? They will interact with this nanoparticle and they will aggregate this nanoparticle. So the interparticle distance of nanoparticle decreases. Then this proper, this color is changes to blue kind of. But when you add heparin, then there is a strong specific interaction of heparin and protamin. Then what will happen? This, uh, then protamin will release this nanoparticle. Then further this color, color is original color will come out. So with this uh, aggregation, de-aggregation, assembly and disassembly way, we could be able to monitor the concentration of protamin and heparin. You can see when you add protamin, you can see how its absorbance is increasing, slowly decreasing, then wavelength is shifting. And uh, uh, from this shifting in the absorbance, uh, uh, change in the absorbance and also the shifting of wavelength that can give you the change in the concentration of protamin. And when you add heparin, you can see then further it releases, even it is goes in this direction. It is releasing the nanoparticle, the absorbance is increasing. So you can see here the nanoparticle is initially like this, they are uh, somehow at different distances. Uh, but when you add some protein, you can see some aggregation takes place, the color looks like this. When you add a high concentration, a strong aggregation takes place. But when you add heparin, you can see de-aggregation takes place. By this aggregation, de-aggregation method, we could be able to use this uh, uh, nanoparticle for optical sensing of polyiron drugs. So the overall, you can see this biosensors have a lot of role, whether it's optical biosensor, optical sensor, Hello. Okay. So I'm audible. Uh, so a lot of applications of this electrochemical and by sensor and the electrochemical sensor, optical sensor for food analysis, study of biomolecules, their interactions, drug development, crime detection, and uh, you can see those who are going for drinking and driving case. 
you can use this alkyl dehydrogen bisensor. There are a lot of applications and a lot of scopes are there further develop new material, nanomaterial for this kind of applications. So uh, this is uh, my This is my last section. Very few, two, three slides are there. Uh, let me complete. Uh, okay, so I have time. Uh, Dr. Pradhan, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Time yeah. is there, sir. Time More is there. Half an hour is there. Oh, that's good. So let me add another section I can discuss. So is it possible I can take only two one minute break? I got an important call. Can I give a call? Then yes. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Participants, you can write your queries and question in the questionnaires in the chat box. So at the last of the session, I can uh, detect the question, so I will elaborate. Okay, now, uh, now I'm audible, madam. Yes, sir, audible. Yeah. So in the last session, you see how you can use this nanoparticle for bioimaging, uh, cell viability as a study and anti cancer drug development. Because this uh, program is based on that. So let me discuss how you can develop some nanoparticle for that application. So, so it's kind of interesting application. So in this case, what we did, so we developed some kind of carbon quantum dots, carbon nanodots, you can say. So these are the nanodots, how we synthesize, because this sequence helps helps is a kind of buffer molecule. It's simple to say a biomolecule. We try to do some hydrothermal uh, synthesis process, and with that synthesis process, we could be able to develop some very tiny, less than five nanometer carbon nanodots. You can see carbon quantum dots. So it's uh, you can put in the UV light, it is, you get some uh, luminescence properties. So uh, these are the nanodots we synthesize. These carbon nanodots. And we have done some characterization. So, what are the size of this nanoparticle? It's less than 5 nanometer. And these are the AFM to understand how many layers. Uh, of successful characterization of this uh, carbon nano dots, we try to utilize these nano dots as uh, some kind of this by imaging uh, <coughs> cell hybrid assay study, anti cancer drug delivery. How we utilize this nanoparticle, carbon nanoparticle, for uh, some kind of cancers or uh, cancer drug delivery, like a toxic reduction, I will discuss about that. So before that, so suppose any kind of uh, uh, particle you want to do a drug delivery, so it should go to the uh, like healthy person, it should go to a biological body. So that means it should be like uh, some cell hybrid assay study should be there, so that it should be biocompatible to normal cells or healthy cells. So if it is not biocompatible, you cannot push to the uh, living organism because then it will kill the health cells. So there is no use whether it will go for to kill the cancer cells. So first we study this uh, <coughs> uh, cell viability test and uh, cell imaging through cell imaging. We try to understand whether this uh, carbon dots is turning to the cell or not. You can see this is a study and uh, this work we published in Journal of Antichemistry B in collaboration with Dr. Rupesh Das, who is my collaborator at the Institute of Life Science. No, goodness, sir. So here we try to develop some kind of carbon dots to from a simple biomolecule like F. So uh, after a successful synthesis, we try to study the uh, cell viability test with some kind of human cells like HEC-293 and S357 cells. And this we observe that these are biocompatible in nature because they are not going to kill this kind of human uh, healthy cells. And also by imaging study how this uh, 
products is entered into the uh, cells that has been captured through by imaging uh, that through a conference or microscope we have observed. So after uh, successful, uh, we understand this uh, carbon dots are bicompatible nature that is not going to harm to the uh, normal or healthy cells. Then we try to immobilize some kind of uh, anti-cancer drug, toxilubicin. Uh, then how we immobilize some chemical process we did in our laboratory, we developed this approach to immobilize the toxilubicin on this carbon nano, carbon nano dots, carbon nano particles. So, and also we study the, uh, their release by changing different pH. We observed that at different pH like pH 5 and pH 7.4, the drug is easily released. So, if you go to the cell, the definitely the drug can be released from the um, carbon dot. Sometimes what happens, you immobilize some drug, but the drug will not get released. So, the, there is no use of that process. So, here we observe that this nanoparticle modified drug can be easily released from the or discharged from the nanoparticle surface. And uh, after that study, then we <laughs> checked, uh, oh, then we checked how this, uh, uh, we immobilize this. Uh, Toxirubicin. Toxirubicin was a uh, cancer, anti-cancer drug. Then uh, after uh, immobilizing this anti-cancer drug, toxirubicin on carbon nanodot, we tried to study some cancer cells. The cancer cell is 357, that is culture there in ILS. So they have taken this sample. I modified this toxirubicin on the carbon dots. You can see how that, uh, this uh, uh, drug modified carbon nanodots is entered into the Cancer cells and it is getting getting killed. That can be easily viewed through this confocal, confocal microscope by, by imaging. And also, you can observe that this uh, only dogs when you enter to the cells, that uh, uh, you say cell viability. You see how, how much it is getting getting killed. The cancer cells. You can see when you use this nanoparticle modified drug, it is effect is poor compared to the. Uh, this carbon dots. That's why this nanoparticle is used as a very good drug delivery purpose because the drug can be easily transported from <clears throat> uh, through the cells and it can go to the targeted cancer cell and uh, less drugs can be utilized because nowadays you know, these, these drugs not only kill the um, <clears throat> cancer cells but also kill the uh, normal or healthy cells. So that's why the uh, <clears throat> apply of these drugs should be very less quantity. So that's why this nanoparticle uh, modified drugs or drug delivery is very much important. So here we study some carbon nanodots because this carbon nanodot is bicompatible with nature because when it is going to the uh, living, say, living body, it is not can be used for anti-cancer drug delivery. So in summary, so that what are the sections I covered from nanomaterial synthesis to their application, electrochemical sensor, electrochemical biosensor, optical sensor and drug delivery. There is a lot of applications I've understood from the data what I presented. So in the summary, I should not tell much on that. So from the summary, you could understand this nanotechnology or the application nanomaterials is really very good and a lot of scope is there and they are solving to our society and our health. So this nanotechnology is really ubiquitous and pervasive and it has a lot of uh, contribution to the society. So it is an emerging field in all areas of science, engineering, technology, because nano science and nano technology is interdisciplinary. Because chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics, all is working in this uh, line. So that's why there is a lot of scope for this uh, direction. So that's why I welcome to all kids nano world and you can pursue your career and you can encourage your student to uh, go on this direction to develop some kind of new things uh, to solve the purpose for the world. And uh, with this, I acknowledge, I should thank to my director of this institute. They have given a lot of support to establish a good lab at CSRI and the Bhubaneswar. Now to all my PhD scholars, before uh, first second slide, I have shown their photo. They are really working so hard and uh, they have, because, because of them only this much work I have done and uh, we have developed that kind of systems. And all my postdoc students, project scholars, and also collaborators like uh, Rupesh Das, Dr. Rupesh Das from ILS has helped in drug delivery. Similarly, a lot of other collaborators from German, other um, international collaborators, Indian collaborators, those are helping me to understand the mechanism and the uh, characters, a lot of 
support with their support, we have to develop this kind of things. And also at the last I came to funding support there, we got the money to carry out this work. CSR, CSR Youngstimes Award Project, VRNS, MRA, MNRE, NALCO, DST. I got the uh, thank to all this funding support. When I write a project, they have funded me to carry out the work. And at the last, not the least, I thank to all of the participants and the organizer for their presence to listen my talk. Thank to all of you. Thank you so much. So I, my talk is over now. So now I request all of you who have any query, so I am happy to do it.